Office of Public Health. I am really looking forward to today's discussion and can't wait to hear from the outstanding panelists that we have here today. This year, the National Park Service and the US Public Health Service are celebrating their centennial partnership to protect, promote, and advance health in parks. As part of this celebration, the NPS Office of Public Health and the National Environmental Education, Education Foundation are hosting the third installment how, to outdoor access for the disability community. I'm so sorry, I messed up this entire introduction. As part of the celebration, the NPS Office of Public Health and the National Environmental Education Foundation are hosting the third installment of the Power of Parks for Health Roundtable series. Today, we will discuss present and historical barriers to outdoor access for the disability community, examine an accessibility project from Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, and highlight strategies and opportunities to improve access to parks and public lands. Please note that this webinar will be recorded. Before we start with our discussion, I have a few ground rules to cover. This is a platform for us to generate discussion. We may face some tough questions and our panelists may share experiences that are strikingly different than your opinions, experiences, or knowledge. Keep an open mind and remember our panelists are sharing their own personal experiences and knowledge. Be respectful and mind your comments in the chat. Hate speech and disrespectful language will not be tolerated and may result in your removal. And lastly, we have a lot to cover and only 90 minutes to share. Unfortunately, we may not have time to get your specific question, but we will follow up with you by email with a list of resources and a recording of this webinar. So again, I thank you all for joining us. And now I will hand it over to our panelists to do introductions, starting with Mr. Scott Tucker of the National Park Service. Mute. Oh man, I did it right away too. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Tucker, Superintendent of Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore in beautiful Northern Michigan. Really excited to share some of our uh, positive uh, experiences up here with you tonight. Uh, my name is Lori Pope and I am uh, the co-chair of the Accessibility Committee for the Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes. And we work in coordination with the, national, with the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park. Um, I've been involved um, with the organization for a little over three years and um, have really seen how our relationship has grown, not only with the park, but with the community and how we are better able to help people access this beautiful park. And I'm Jean Ash. I'm on the Accessibility Committee with Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes. Um, I've been involved with Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes for probably about nine years and have really seen the growth between the park and the Friends relationship and park accessibility. Thank you. And I am Ray Bloomer and I am your moderator. I am an accessibility specialist with the accessibility support program out of the uh, Washington office. And uh, I wanna start off with a few things. First of all, I wanna talk a little bit about what the program is all about. When we talk about the, uh, the word accessibility and where does that fit within the history of the National Park Service? Well, the National Park Service does have a history of accessibility. It started off back in the mid 1970s and it was relatively slow. It was before we had very much in terms of regulations or anything like that. In 1980, we had an office on accessibility that was initiated out of the Washington office. And that happens to be the accessibility support program as it exists today, supported uh, by the uh, branch chief, Jeremy Bazell. Also, throughout that history, it paralleled the legislation that also occurred. In 1968, we had the uh, 68 Architectural Barriers Act. 1973, the Rehabilitation Act, in particular Section 504, with regulations for the Department of the Interior coming about in 1987. And then a little bit later, we had the Americans with Disabilities Act, which included the rest of the country, uh, not just the federal government. The Americans with Disabilities Act included state and local government, it included areas of public accommodation, which were uh, areas that are privately open. This included nonprofits. As a result of the Americans with Disabilities Act, new regulations were passed and those regulations impacted the National Park Service. So that history of accessibility continued to grow. 
the original standards that we had to live by were primarily building standards. And then after the passage of the ADA and the development of new standards, we also had standards that addressed things that didn't exist before, such as areas of boating and fishing, trails, campgrounds, beaches, scenic overlooks. And with those regulations came a greater body of knowledge to address accessibility. Now, when I talk about accessibility, I am using a term which means that whatever it is we're addressing, whether it is physical accessibility or programmatic accessibility, it means that we are meeting whatever minimum standards or regulations that exist to enable people with disabilities to obtain the same opportunity for the services or activities that we provide or programs that we provide in the National Park Service and under the ADA in areas of state and local government or public accommodations. The key word I used there was minimum standards or guidelines. Within the National Park Service, our policy is to implement the standards of, or implement rather, the principles of universal design wherever we can. The principles of universal design, it's the design of products or environments to be used by all people to the greatest extent possible. That's the definition. And there are seven principles that are utilized to uh, uh, design according to uh, universal design. Applying those principles means that at a minimum, we're starting from the minimum guidelines and regulations and then going up from there, enabling people to have the greatest level of opportunity uh, when they're participating in program services and activities. So we have a few things that we're going to talk about tonight, and there's nothing better when it comes to looking at a park uh, unit of the National Park Service that by example applies the principles of universal design and does everything to meet the needs and create opportunities for people with disabilities than Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. I do want to identify and put a little bit of a definition to people with disabilities. The, I guess the legal definition is for people with disabilities is a person with a disability is an individual with a significant limitation to major life activities. Major life activities are things such as walking, seeing, hearing, breathing, communicating, processing information, all things like that. That's a definition of people with disabilities and it represents 61 million people in the United States. And a couple of those people are individuals that we will hear from tonight, along with Superintendent Scott Tucker. And Scott, I'm going to pass it over to you because the beginning of any type of a successful program starts with a very strong commitment from park management. So I just want to say hello to you. You and I have been colleagues for a while, and I'd like to hear a little bit about what does that management commitment mean? as far as Sleeping Bear Dunes. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Ray, good to hear your voice again. Uh, you know, Sleeping Bear Dunes is celebrating its 50th anniversary, actually 50, 51st anniversary this year. Uh, Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes celebrated their 25th anniversary last year as well. And so for the last 25 years, the park and our friends group have successfully um, provided opportunities for, you know, one and a half to 1.7 million visitors a year in the National Lakeshore. And as Ray just said, 61 million Americans um, have a disability. Our goal as a park is to uh, make sure that a national park can greet and welcome every American that wants to come here. And hopefully they can do it on their own terms. If you ask me my management philosophy, it's a visitor can come to Sleeping Bear and experience their national park in their own way, make their own choices of how they experience it. 
and uh, leave with a postcard memory that will uh, be a family memory for, your, memory for years to come. Our relationship with Friends of Sleeping Bear is a two-way street, and you'll hear a little bit about that today. We have, you know, we are a bureaucratic beast, and so we, uh, we do what we can with the resources we have. But Friends of Sleeping Bear is attached to us at the hip, um, either helping us fulfill our ideas or bringing spectacular ideas to us that we never even thought of. And between the two organizations, really implementing a holistic approach for visitors to, to visit this uh, 107, this, this uh, 1.7 million visitors and seven, over 70,000 acres of public lands. Thank you, Scott. Gene Esch, I would like to have you comment a little bit on what does that commitment by the National Park Service that Scott just spoke of at Sleeping Bear Dunes, what does that mean to you and the involvement that you have had with the park at Sleeping Bear Dunes? When I um, first started um, doing volunteer work with Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes, um, there was little access. Um, I am a wheelchair user and um, most of the trails were difficult. We do have um, the Heritage Trail, which is a multi-use trail, but that was just being developed. Um, so the, the partnership that Friends has formed with um, actually the park beginning that by asking if we would help with some trail assessment, um, which is how I got involved, um, has really expanded my ability to explore the park from what we've worked with, with um, the park service and friends together to bring beach accessibility, um, the track chair program, which, which brings some trail accessibility, um, and assessing the trails and uh, with help uh, from Cindy Burkhauer, who's a um, specialist in um, assessing trails and outdoor recreation accessibility. Um, we were able to, to map most every trail in the park and um, individuals are able to go in and look at those maps and say, whether you're, you know, have a disability that you use a wheelchair or if you have kids with a stroller under universal design, you could look at those maps and say, okay, we could take this trail this far and then we're gonna have trouble, but that's okay because we wanna see this feature on the trail. So as Scott said, every individual can make, can use those maps and make a choice of how they can explore the park. So it's, it's been a great partnership. I think. And Jean, I know that you have been involved with the park for a good number of years. Uh, some of that has been uh, prior to Scott's arrival as superintendent. How long has the accessibility committee of the French group been involved at Sleeping Bear and how long have you been involved? Um, I've been involved with the accessibility committee. Well, actually, I think the accessibility committee started when the park asked Friends of Sleeping Bear if they could help with trail assessment. And, um, you know, our initial thought was, well, this will be easy. Um, <laughs> we'll go out. Uh, the person who worked with accessibility in the park said that, you know, we, we need to know slope of hills and we need to know, uh, know the, where it drops off on the sides and how wide it is. And, okay, and you can use this and you can use that and here's a wheel to measure. And we went out and said, oh, we really can't do this. Um, we didn't, we, we, we really didn't have enough knowledge. Um, through NEF, we were able to get grants, which I think one of the hardest things about getting accessibility in, the par in, in, a, in a park is finding grants that will allow the experts to come in and teach how to do trail assessment, what is universal design, 
how to implement that. Um, most grants want to see what they produce. They want to see, oh, we bought, you used our money to buy this boardwalk so people can access, access the beach. They don't really want to pay for the time it takes to assess that beach. Um, what's going to work? What's not going to work? What is the park going to, because you have to look at the natural resources. I was, well, let's just put a boardwalk in there. You know, that will work. And then you have to realize that there's environmental things that it impacts and um, that's all effective. And I, I kind of lost my question. So I've been involved with it for, for about um, the whole nine years is when the accessibility committee started. And I, I think we've come a long way from having really no beach access to having beach access in two places. Uh, we have um, a fishing pier, we have a, a kayak launch, um, we have the, the map system and our, um, well, for me, because it was very emotional, the track chair program where I could finally and um, finally go out on a trail with my friends, nobody trying to shove a wheelchair through the sand up the hill and see what other people were seeing. The views, the trees, the silence, um, it was that we can share that and that Sleeping Bear Dunes management has allowed us and worked with us so that can be shared has just, I, I have a really hard time and I feel like people think I'm faking this, but I almost cry every time I talk about um, that experience of, of seeing what everyone was talking about for the first time. Um, it's obviously, yeah. Uh, obviously, Jean, that is emotional for you. Yeah. Lori, I'd like you to also talk a little bit about your experiences in uh, working with park management and with the friends group. Um, also. Okay. Well, I uh, came on, on board just a little over three years ago. I originally <clears throat> came as a volunteer to work on the trail. Um, that was kind of my interest. And, um, but I also have an, uh, a uh, history or a career in special education. So I was approached um, by Jean and some other board members. And they said, you know, we have this accessibility committee. Would you be interested in, in taking over and helping with the chairing of the committee? And I said, sure, of course. It just kind of felt like a natural fit for me. I love the outdoors. And I have had some experience with a variety of students with, you know, different disabilities. Um, what I found is it's just been a real, and kind of echoing some of the things that Gina said and Scott, it's a, it's a real back and forth um, effort. Um, as we said before, the park needs us, we need the park or nothing's gonna move forward. Um, it's, you know, it's been a real, a learning experience um, because like you said, you, like Gene said, you know, some things you don't think about, you think, oh, like, I'm just gonna go do this, put this in, but you don't realize there might be an endangered plant there. And that's, you know, then that's got to be addressed and assessed, um, little things like that, all the way to just, you know, um, the park providing their, um, their staff and their workers to help with things such as putting in an accessibility bathroom, like, it, for example, at the, um, where we host, I mean, where we house the track chair, we need an accessibility bathroom, we needed some other things, and, you um, you know, they worked with us. Obviously, we weren't able to do that and they, they stepped in, but it's always ongoing. There's always an ongoing back and forth. How can we work together? What can we do? It's not always fun, you know? I mean, it's not always easy. Sometimes there's some other challenges, but um, for the most part, it, it's, it's really been a, a really neat experience, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott, one thing that happens in parks very frequently when we talk about bringing in volunteers or friends group is that it takes a large commitment of time in order to maintain that relationship. 
Uh, it's a group of people that are working in a park and whether they're paid individuals or such as park staff or whether uh, they're individuals that are volunteering their time, some level of oversight, oversight still has to occur to make sure that everything is happening, that uh, any type of uh, standards are being implemented, rules and regulations are followed. How do you as a manager, how does this work in terms of the relationship between you and your staff work with folks like Lori and Jean to make sure that all this works in a uh, collaborative manner? Uh, good question, Ray. You know, one of the one of the most successful things that we can do is what Lori just said is open communication and putting ourselves in each other's shoes, knowing what we need to go through as federal land managers to preserve and protect these resources, and knowing also the passion that comes from a volunteer that is bringing a skill set or a uh, idea to the table. Uh, and it's a commitment on uh, both parties' sides. You know, from the Park Service side, we have an amazing volunteer coordinator who is that day-to-day -day work link that works to make sure all the paperwork is taken care of, that the volunteer agreements are in place, that the paperwork is in, is uh, there so that there is a, uh, a workplace injury with a volunteer, that those uh, resources are taken care of. And then it's a um, top-down, bottom-up, understanding of what the end goal is and the end goal for a national park employee is to preserve and protect and provide access and so if we knock it down to those simple ideas of providing access for the american people it, that doesn't say just for some american people that's sort of for it's for all american people and so i am really proud that my roads and trails foreman the first time any project comes up he asks, what's the accessibility component of this? How are we gonna get a visitor from their car to the trailhead, to the restroom, to a point where they can make a decision based on the natural uh, layout, how far they may be able to hike a trail. And then we will take a step back and say, what resources or what um, you know, overlook can we ensure is part of that experience? From a management perspective, you know, one of the pieces for success, and it's it's a tough one, it's the question of sustainability. I think there's nothing worse than getting a amazing project or program going and then not being able to fulfill it uh, 100%. You know, we're not looking for A plus work, we're looking for B plus to A minus work. Um, but when it comes to uh, providing access, we're shooting for that A. And so uh, ensuring sustainability of the program of those volunteers that are excited up front to uh, participate, but giving them the tools and resources of volunteer recruitment, of just support, education, knowledge, and um, that we're all on the same page is a piece of that, that success. And that's where I think we've been really successful here. And I know Lori will probably talk a little bit about the sustainability of programs a little bit later because it's really easy to get programs going but it's a little bit harder to keep that ball going down the field and i i do want to hear uh, from laurie uh, regarding sustainability in a little while but laurie i do also when you talk about sharing the accessibility uh uh friends group what i'd really like you to talk about right now is how do you go about recruiting? Because that's, I know many of the people that are listening today, they wanna to find out how do you build on that group of people and get de or develop or find people that have the passion that you and Jean have demonstrated so far? Yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about that and then Jean can maybe add. I, you know, we have a really good group of um, PR people. Um, commun or communication people, and there we have some great, um, you know, things that we do on our website that we do on uh, different types of PR um, avenues to try to gather or, or try to, to recruit volunteers. And we'll be very, um, you know, like for the track chair program, it, you know, we very we were very um, like you know t talked about the track chair program, kind of how what what we were looking for and how we were going to do it. 
and then just got the, you know just got that information out there um it you know it, it was surprising i mean i think not surprising but it it was a little surprising we we were able to get a pretty good good group of volunteers i would say um pretty quickly uh, wouldn't you say, Gene, as far as people that were interested, but then you've got to take that a step further um, once you get your volunteers. And I don't know if this is the time to talk about it, but, you know, and give them the training um, to, so they can, they are able to um, do it, you know, to understand the program and what you're asking of them. But it's, the thing with volunteers is it's ongoing. We're always, for lack of a better word, advertising for volunteers um, in, in some way or another um, through different channels, um, you know, word of mouth, you, you get, sometimes you get our volunteers out there that are, are, you know, saying, gosh, this is a great thing. We're loving what we're doing and we get volunteers that way. Um, and then, like I said, through our, uh, different things that our communication team does. So. Okay. Jean, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think initially, um, Finding volunteers was a little bit harder when we were doing the assessment part. Um, I think we were fortunate to be able to draw from Friends of Sleeping Bear board um, who was willing, who were willing to come out and and kind of learn what what accessibility is all about. Um, we did some programs um, with the NEF grants that were. Um, um, training in universal design, and we invited um, people from Disability Network in the area, from um, land conservancies in the area, so they could learn about universal design, but it also got out the word about what we were doing and, and that we were doing trail assessment. That brought some volunteers in, I think that, um, you know, by, by volunteering, they could learn more and go back to their, their original organization. But it also helped spread the word by getting other organizations involved in what we were doing. And I, I think that's one way that um, we're able to do it. The, the track chair program, there's a lot of excitement with it. And I always say it's the first volunteer program that I work with that if we get a volunteer, get them trained and have them actually go out with the track share, they thank us for the opportunity to volunteer and they come back the next time. Now, this is our third year with it. We had the first year, then last year we didn't run it because of um, COVID and then started it this year. And like Laura said, we, we were a little wondering how many volunteers we'd get. And we were pleasantly surprised with the number. Um, it's, a, it's a long pro, I don't know, Lori, how to say that. It's, it's like the training takes about four hours, maybe mm -hmm. four to six hours. And, and that's a big commitment. But, and I think that sometimes scares people off. But once they do it, they, also can help bring other people in because they're so excited about taking somebody on a trail for the first time in either ever or 10 years or five years or a year. So, um, so there, I, I think staying active and reaching out to other organizations helps a lot. Okay. Uh, I do want, you are dying to talk about that track chair. I want you to tell us about <laughs> it. How did you get, <laughs> how did you get it, uh, what it is, and uh, how it fits into the park? So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, Jean, you start off, please. Sure. Um, well, Friends of, or Sleeping Bear Dunes, um, we, we were doing the trail assessments, and um, we thought we knew what we wanted to do with some of the trails, and and then the park was, and um, it was exciting. They were able to get a wilderness designation on a lot of land. I don't know how many acres, Scott. I don't know that off the top of my head, um, but a lot. And um, a lot of the trails 30, that, go ahead. 35,000. 35, okay. Hey. 
gorgeous. In those in those acres, there were a lot of trails that we had planned on. Oh, we can widen this bridge a little bit. Well, with the wilderness uh, designation, we couldn't do those things. So we had to look at what's an alternative. Um, and um, we had heard about the track chair and um, it, it was a process. It took probably four years from the time we first had the track chair um, representative come up and bring it up for a demonstration for the accessibility committee um, to actually purchasing it. I think that the final obstacle was solved with the parks concern about safety when Scott and uh, Tom, the deputy superintendent, went out on the track chairs on the trail that they were suggesting might be able to be used. And uh, Scott tried his best to, um, to do damage to the trail or to the chair. And um, it stood up to, to all of his trials. <laughs> Um, and I believe he looked at me and said, buy it. So, um, it was, um, you know, definitely get, getting the park. We'd been working with the park. Um, we, we worked with the trails people, what trail would be appropriate. We worked with, um, the volunteer coordinator. We worked, you know, kind of with everybody, but, but we had to sell the safety and, um, I was convinced, but um, that's again, getting the park um, to realize, and I think again, that's where we're fortunate is to get the park to realize this is important enough to take four hours away from my desk to come out and look at this potential program. So we got the track chair. Um, we had an open house that um, featured not only that, but um, about the same time we were able to get a boardwalk in um, by one of the, um, I would say, most popular or at least well-known beach areas. Um, so we could feature that. Um, we could show some of our mapping. And um, the, I don't know I, how many of you know the track chair. It, it has like sort of a tank track wheel in a, in a triangle. The great thing about it is the pressure it exerts per square inch is less than when you step down. So environmentally, we're not damaging anything on the trail. Um, it's, um, it's I, I, I call it environmentally friendly, I guess. Um, but it's able to, um, because of that track design, it's able to get, we have, well, Sleeping Bear Dunes, we have a lot of sand. Um, regular beach chairs have a hard time because that sand shifts, but the track chair can handle that. Um, it, can, it can climb a fairly steep, steep slope. Um, it tilts so that as the user, um, if, if any of you are familiar or user of a regular wheelchair, if you're going downhill on your regular chair, you feel like you're going to fall out. And if you're going backwards, you feel like you're going to tip back. Um, this chair allows you to, to love, kind of keep level. So we go out to a, a beautiful overlook and um, the, the reactions that we get, the, the pictures that we get back from our volunteers or from the users themselves, the smiles. Um, you know, it it takes. It's it's just worth the effort that the park and the friends group put in. We were able to get a second track chair, so we're able to run two of them. Um, people can take them out together if there's. Um, we actually have a a mother and a daughter going out tomorrow. Um, we, they can kind of pick by size. One's a little bit smaller. So they both pretty much work for everyone, I would say. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's an exciting program. And uh, we were the first national park to get one. Um, and there, I, 
I know more parks are, are interested in and we hear from them. Um, and we hope that we're helping. We try to be, um, we had a state park in Colorado who was helpful for, with, to us as far as um, issues of insurance and liability. And we try to share that information just like it was shared with us. There's no, you know, don't redevelop it, use what we have. So it's, um, it's an exciting program. I could go on for like the next hour, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Lori, you talked the other day when we were uh, uh, discussing the track chair of the need to make sure that you do have a sustainable program as far as the track chair is concerned. Right. What do you mean by that? How do you how do you maintain that level of sustainability so that this is something that goes on for multiple years rather than something that's here today and gone tomorrow? Right. Well, you know, when I came on, the 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 program was already um, established. The chair was there and there was like Jean and Scott, all this excitement about it. And it was really wonderful, but we did not, some of the things we're, we're struggling with right now, we did not really realize until we had that first year of the program. Um, it was a real eye opener, I think for all of us, the amount of time that is needed to run a program like the track chair. Um, it is, and that's what we're really working on this year because um, you know, Jean and Kathy have done a wonderful job, but they're not going to be able to do, keep it up, keep up on it like, like they are now. It's ending up being more than what we thought. When you think about a volunteer um, and you have something like, um, I don't know, adopt a beach and a volunteer signs up and they go out maybe once every two weeks or, what, or whatever they choose to do, um, that's pretty sustainable. Even our volunteers that go out with the track chair um, uh, visitors, that's been, that hasn't been bad because we've had a lot of very enthusiastic people and because it is so rewarding, um, it, we don't have, you know, we have, that is not the issue. What we're finding where, where we're gonna really need to do some work is the everyday running of the reservation system and the coordination of the volunteers. It's not just like somebody reserves a chair and then magically the volunteer is matched up. You know, things are read to make sure that the, um, there isn't going to be any um, problem for the track chair user. Um, things have to be reviewed and, um, and things have to be set up. And there's a lot of, um, Gene and Kathy have set up a wonderful system, but there's, it's, it's a lot of back and forth. Um, of uh, corresponding with the volunteers and the um, visitors. So what we're, what we're kind of dealing with right now is saying, okay, well, Jean and Kathy did it. Now they're getting ready to like pass on the hat and see if we can um, get some other people. We put out, you know, um, ads, or not ads, but announcements, you know, please come and volunteer for the track chair program. And if you're also interested or, you know, in program management, let us know. Well, it hasn't been a big, big answer for that. Luckily, a couple of our volunteers that are taking the track chair out are, um, you know, volunteering a little bit to help with that reservation system. Um, so, you know, it's that kind of, so we're working on that, just that every, because like I said, once those reservations are open, you're talking about a five day a week, at least, somebody has to be checking those. Because when you have somebody, somebody puts in a reservation and there's only, a, we, we require at least three days in advance, doesn't give a lot of time for you to get a volunteer together and, and match them up. So if you don't have somebody checking those reservations almost every day or at least five days a week, the program's not going to work. Um, so that's one part of the sustainability. I think too, it, you know, it's just um, like I said that, and, and there's a lot of maintenance that goes in with the chairs. There's a lot of training that we do every year at the beginning. Um, so we're learning as we go, and and, and I don't want to discourage people. I think it's all possible. We're doing it. And we're just trying to figure out ways um, to, to make sure that we keep it going without putting too much burden on any one individual um, to keep the program. <coughs> so. Um, okay. 
Thank you, Laurie. Uh -huh. I know that uh, throughout the United States, I talked about the 61 million people that have disabilities. And at any one time, as many as 25 million people are experiencing a temporary disability, the inability to possibly be able to walk from one destination to another. Scott, could you talk about that and the track chair? <laughs> I think you threw me under the bus, Ray. Uh, you know, the track chair program is, you know, you know, from a management perspective, just for this, for Lori and Jean, it is a life-changing experience for a visitor to take a hike with their family to a location that they've never set. I saw the look on Jean's face um, the first time she went to an overlook to see Lake Michigan that in 10 years she'd never seen before. Um, we've used the chair for our snowshoe program in the winter. We have uh, an amazing fourth grader snowshoe program where we had kids in wheelchairs that normally would have stayed back at school because the class was going on snowshoes that were able to hop in the track chair and accompany um, their classmates for the first time ever. And I tear up as I talk about it. Um, but what Ray was referring to, I've actually been a user of our track chair myself. Uh, so three summers ago, I dislocated my knee and I needed uh, to participate in a park event that was out in the park off a trail that I couldn't get to on my crutches. And so I called Friends of Sleeping Bear and made a reservation for the track chair where they um, put it, brought it to the location, gave me my quick orientation. And I was actually able to participate in a park event uh, that I would have missed um, if I didn't have the opportunity for that temporary um, relief to uh, to just an injury. So it is it is life changing for the users. And as as Lori said, it's life changing for the volunteers that support it. Well, um, yeah, if I could just jump in one of the most touching um, times that I went out, um, because we, we're not requiring that, that somebody has some type of a major, like Scott, major disability, anybody that has a mobility challenge for whatever reason, even if it's just age, can go out. But one of the most touching ones that I had was a family who was a mother and a uh, father and their two children. And the mom had been going through chemo, extensive chemo, very, very, very weak, not able, hadn't been able to do anything with her family other than deal with this cancer. They decided, it's going to make me cry. They decided to take this trip. And for the first time, she kept saying to me in a long time, I am able to do something with my family that's just normal to, to keep us, to get us away from what I've been dealing with. And it was, it was so, so touching. And she, it was, it was really one of the most touching experiences that, and I've been out on, on, on plenty of them. And, um, but we get those. We, it's just like, a, it's just like, my God, I was able to do something with my family and it was something normal. And we just were able to enjoy our vacation. So and I'm just going to jump in here. That's that's what makes us really want to work on the can't say it sustainability issue. Um, Kathy, who Lori refers to, is, started the accessibility committee with me when when we first were approached on on assessment, and we've been been running it, and it it is time consuming, um, and um, we we really want to work to to make sure it's sustained. We we don't want that chair to be sitting somewhere. Um, there's too many people that that need that experience. And when I say need it, they need it for their their heart and soul. I mean it it's just it's it's powerful. And well, thank you for sharing the testimonials. That does mean an awful lot to hear how visitors are not only enjoying it, but for many individuals, even though they may be able to get from point A to point B using a manual wheelchair or crutches or a walker, sometimes having something like the track chair will enable them independence to go to the, the next level above and beyond what they can physically do themselves. So thank you for sharing that. I also want to ask relative to the, uh, the track chair, how frequently does it go out? 
how frequently is it uh, is it borrowed? Well, I'll I'll start. Well, the first year that they did the program, we we were doing it seven days a week, um, and uh, it was you know. Then we had the year off, and then it was we when we came back. Um, there were still some concerns of how many volunteers we were going to have, and again, the sustainability of it. Seven days a week is a lot. And the way we had it set up, and we still do, is we have uh, a morning time and an afternoon time. So a chair went, goes out at 10 and then another chair goes out at two. Now we have two chairs. So it is possible that two chairs could go out at 10 and two chairs could go out at two. Um, for this year so far, we have just done four days a week. Um, and that has helped somewhat with the sustainability. Um, yes, we'd like to offer it more, but um, it's, you know, for right now with what we have four days a week and, and there we, we did talk to other people that are running the track chair. Um, a lot of the state parks in this state have it and, you know, everyone does it a little differently. Um, so I guess what, I'm, what I want to say to everybody is it's not something that has to be done every day. You do it the best you can with what you have. Um, and if it's, it means that you're doing it four days a week instead of seven, then that's what it is. Um, so. Hey, Lori, okay. what's the charge time between uses? Because I know that's also a piece of yeah, it. See that, yeah, all these things, as we, as we had our first year, it was like, oh, we can't, we got to allow some charging time. Um, it takes a good couple hours. So what the, the um, average time that person goes out is about two hours. So if they go from 10 and they're usually back by noon, then the, the, our volunteers are trained to get, that's the other thing, you have to have electricity on site. And where this trail was, we had a the park with the parks help or we wouldn't have been able to do it. They had to bring in electricity. We have a storage trailer. So we hook up the chairs, right? Put them in the, the, the trailer and plug them in. So it takes about two hours for it to go back out again um, and, and to feel comfortable with it. Um, and we've never had a problem, knock on wood, with the, one of the chairs running out of uh, uh, you know, power. Um, but it's it, a lot of these things we, we, I'm sure you guys thought about, I wasn't in the initial part of the program, but a lot of things have come about just from running the program. You know, you never know all the things that you're gonna run into until you start something. Um, so that's just, that's, and then like I Thanks. said, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Okay, I'm just gonna say thank you. I do wanna move us on to another area of accessibility <clears throat> that has really had a lot of impact uh, at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, and that is something called TAPE. TAPE is an acronym for Targeted Accessibility Improvement Program. It was a Washington-based program uh, that has been funded. It funded nine different parks where looking at uh, improvement with universal design being the benchmark as to whether it was applied, whether it was applied effectively, a benchmark for success. The nine different parks represented a lot of different areas that we have within the entire National Park Service. Um, camping and water access, which is uh, part of what uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes uh, had applied for and received the funding for one of the Tate projects. They also had historic buildings. We had memorials, ships, trails, museums, nine different parks with, that were significantly significantly different in terms of what each of those different parks promoted and what uh, was the primary purpose for people going to those parks. I mentioned entry to exit. We wanted the funding to go into a program or an entire park, if that were the case, that would enable people with disabilities to have a very complete experience. And Scott, I'm wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about how was the uh, TAPE program, how was it implemented, what did it address, and what did it achieve at Sleeping Bear? Yeah, thanks, Ray. You know, Sleeping Bear was lucky to uh, participate in that TAPE program that began, I believe, in 2014, 2015, to uh, secure that an idea of how to create access uh, for everyone. And so the lake shore, you know, we have 70 miles of Lake Michigan shoreline. We also have miles of rivers. We have a hundred miles of hiking trail. 
We have five different campgrounds, and then we have two islands in Lake Michigan as well. And so the park focused on the, what is called the Platte River Corridor. And uh, the Platte River Corridor includes uh, kayaking and canoeing, uh, tubing for casual floats, a campground, uh, fishing, um, a fish cleaning station, picnic areas, pretty much the quintessential park experience. And so that corridor was chosen for us to focus on for that uh, holistic universal access visitor experience. As we sat down at the table, the first thing the park did is we called friends of Sleeping Bear. We called the Accessibility Committee and said, can you come put your head and your knowledge and your experience into this conversation? Then we also reached to the local community, to the Disability Network of Northern Michigan, and asked them to come to the table and really have that core conversation of um, what, what do we need to do to make this welcoming for everyone? And one of the very first things that came out of the Disability Center Network of Northern Michigan was, it's not just about putting my kayak in the water at the top of the river and pulling it out of the water at Lake Michigan. They said it actually starts with the visitor center that is 10 miles away. And we want to be able to go to the Sleeping Bear Dunes Visitor Center, meet with a park ranger, buy our park pass, figure out what choices we wanna make and then go experience with the park. And so quickly the scope went from just about kind of a kayak put in and a kayak pull out of water access and it turned into that holistic view. And so it started with the visitor center with realigning our desks so that they were accessible, uh, realigning the, a couple of elevations of the parking lot coming into the front door. A tactile map was designed for the visitor center. Uh, that anybody, whether uh, the programmatic side, so if someone was visually impaired, they would be able to uh, use Braille and or uh, sensory to, uh, to, to, I, to find their location within Lakeshore. Then it took them to the actual campground. So we haven't even got anywhere near the river yet. And we designed uh, exhibits and programmatic exhibits that uh, anybody can interact with. We redesigned the visitors, the ranger station. Um, so that a visitor could hit the visitor center, go to the ranger station, and then we um, made multiple campsites accessible, not only RV campsites, but tent sites, group sites, and walk-in sites. And so now you went from uh, your home to being able to camp on your terms and the type of site you want with accessible restrooms, accessible water spigots, and accessible showers. And we haven't even gotten to the water launch yet. The next thing uh, the Disability Network said, you know what, we want the choice. And for us, a kayak launch at the midpoint of the river is better than anywhere else. And so we focused our energy on a kayak launch on what is a lake called Loon Lake that is accessible. Um, all of these things were uh, designed with the idea that it wouldn't be this is the accessible route and this is the everybody else route. It was a holistic we did an entire platform that took a visitor from their home to the park, to a fishing pier, to a fish cleaning station, and back to their campsite to have s'mores uh, very successfully. We have not implemented all of that. That sounds really exciting. We haven't implemented it all. Um, we are pecking away. We have the designs for everything I just told you. We have about half of it in place today. And Every year we're using our fee dollars to knock off one more project and one more program for uh, full implementation. So that's the, that's, that's tape in a nutshell, Ray. Scott, it, in the development of the tape program, I know that uh, you really did utilize the Friends Group, but you also reached out to other members of the community to do things like looking at some of the prototyping uh, as the uh, tactile maps were being developed so that people could find out, does this really work? How did that relationship come about? Uh, did, uh, that, it, did that work solely through the friends group or did it expand? Uh, you know, it, uh, it worked with, with friends and I think, and Gene can correct me, I think it really worked uh, with bringing the community in because of the work they had done and created with the trail 
uh, project they had done three or they had begun two to three years earlier, where they brought out this the disability network and asked them to come and help with trailheads and access points. So Friends of Sleeping Bear already had those relationships uh, from the previous project that put all of us at the table uh, for this project. Were there any innovative ideas that came out uh, as a result of the Tate project that other parks might be able to emulate that you're aware of? You know, I, I think a good example of that is uh, a piece of the Tate project that we emulated. Um, as I mentioned before, we have two islands in the middle of Lake Michigan. Uh, one of those has the South Manitou Island lighthouse on it. And uh, we took what we learned from tape of that universal design on a lighthouse accessibility project that hopefully will go, it's going to contracting right now, that if you, when you come off the ferry, there will be an accessible route from the ferry to the half mile trek to the lighthouse. When you arrive at the lighthouse, there will be uh, tactile exhibits I will say our uh, director of visitor services specifically focused that program because of what she learned from the Tate project and the disability network in Northern Michigan. And so uh, the, I guess, how do you emulate it in another park? I think it is you sit down at the very beginning and say, hey, how can everybody that wants to get here or do this activity, how can we use our creativity to find a way to make it happen. And so when we go to, when, when contractors start swinging hammers for the lighthouse project, the end result will be somebody that has a mobility challenge will be able to make it to the lighthouse uh, for that experience. Unfortunately, they won't be able to make it up the lighthouse. There's some challenges we cannot conquer, uh, but somebody that is visually impaired will have tactile um, exhibits uh, of the lighthouse as well. And so there's a, a, we're taking a lot of opportunities from lessons learned from, from tape and putting it into other, other projects in the park. And thank you, Scott. I'm glad that you spoke about the extension of the tape program, because that is what that program was intended to do, to be able to show how we can accomplish accessibility, but also how we can expand it beyond those initial nine projects in those initial nine parks. Another example that I'll also share, and that's the fact that one of the nine projects was the Jefferson Memorial. And the exhibit design firm worked very closely with the park, with accessibility specialists in developing excellent exhibits for Jefferson Memorial. Well, just so happens that Lincoln Memorial had gotten some additional funding to be able to make a lot of new exhibits. And it just so happened that that same exhibit contractor got the contract for the Lincoln Memorial. And they're going to take a lot of the concepts that they learned in the development of exhibits at the, at the Jefferson Memorial and apply it uh, to the Lincoln Memorial. So again, another example of taking it to another part of the same park unit at the Washington uh, uh, Mall, enabling people with disabilities to benefit by the initial TAPE program. Lori, I would like to ask you, when you talked about uh, sustainability, you also made some references to the beach accessibility. And I know at one point you had indicated that it wasn't uh, one of the uh, products that are often referred to uh, uh, that's Moby Mat, but it was a different product because of the movement of the sand. And right. what does it take to get that in? And what does it take to maintain it? Okay. Well, that, that, um, that's an ADA walkway. Um, and uh, it uh, and actually that the park has really taken the lead on that. Um, they're the ones that um, in the springtime um, 
put their crew puts that walkway in. I, you know, I don't know the history of how the walkway came about. I'm sure it's part of the initiative of just making the park more accessible for everyone. Um, but getting that um, walkway put in, it's with the park. Now, sometimes the park, Scott will call, Scott will send out an email or Matt, who's a head of uh, volunteers will say, hey, we've got three or four park people going out to put that walkway in and we need some more help. And so the friends, some of the friends people show up. We do a lot of that things together where we're, where it's some of the friends volunteers and then it's the park crew that put things in, take things out, work on things like that. And then, then, then there's the, the, just the question of like maintaining the walkway. Okay, it's not gonna help if there's a lot of sand on it. Um, and again, we, you know, it's, it's amazing. We were talking about this earlier. It's, right, you heard it's about putting a broom out there and telling people, you know, this is a broom to help keep the, this walkway clean and be surprised how many people pick up that broom and help sweep off that walkway. Um, and, uh, or, or just the local volunteers that we have um, in some other exhibits near the walkway. Um, and, uh, but it does take, you know, it does take some upkeep and it, I think it's, it's really just an ongoing, why don't you say it's got an ongoing, you know, hey, I was, I was down there the other day, there's um, a drop off from the, and we have to fill it in with sand so a wheelchair doesn't, you know, go, if it would happen to go off of it, wouldn't far too far, you know, fall too far. A group is put together and then people go out there and fill in, I was part of that, fill in that sand to make sure it's safe. Um, and I, those kinds of things are always ongoing, I would say, um, in, in, in a lot of the um, uh, accessibility options that are in the park. Scott, do you have anything? Okay. To yeah, you know, so sort of put, put, put it into perspective, uh, Sleep Bear Dunes has been created by geologic forces for thousands of years. And uh, Lake Michigan is the boss, is really what it comes down to. So there's a, a storm can come in and bring six foot waves and take out, you know, uh, chunks of beach. Wind storms can come through uh, and leave three to four feet of sand on top of a boardwalk overnight. And so we have a lot of uh, geologic forces that we are at battle with. The Attawak, uh, this is another example of a, of a project that Friends of Sleeping Bear came to the park and said, we want to provide another way to provide access in Sleeping Bear. And this access point, we have uh, beach wheelchairs, the ones with the big balloons that it takes, you know, Hulk Hogan to be able to push it through the, the sand. Um, we have beach wheelchairs, but Friends of Sleeping Bear, the Accessibility Committee wanted to come up with another way so that someone could literally dip their toes in Lake Michigan. And so we did our, they, we, they did the, uh, the research and the typical Moby Matt was not one that would be successful here in Sleeping Bear. And so the add a walk that we use, um, it's a partnership of putting it in between park employees, our roads and trails folks to make sure it keeps um, level in the sand. Um, it could, you could walk out in the morning and have, as I said, a foot of sand on top of it. And so it takes some, it takes some push from the local public. As Lori said, we keep a broom by it and you won't imagine how many kids would sweep sand off of a boardwalk out in public, but they won't sweep the kitchen floor. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a successful uh, joint venture. It's just another piece of either our great idea or Friends of Sleep Bear's great idea to uh, provide another access point. I'm gonna I add love one that more idea thing. of the, Go I ahead, Jay. Say, I love the idea. I love the idea of the broom. Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> I was just gonna say that the, um, the walkway was, Another one of those community things where um, when we worked with, talked to the park about the Moby Mat and they explained to us that the beach action would keep dislocating the Moby, Moby Mat and we had to find something else. Um, we reached out to other communities who had had access and, you know, what did you use and went in and toured some of those. And um, that's how we came up with the walkway system we have. And actually even the broom idea was from a bike uh, group in Traverse City, Norte, who um, um, has shovels out um, on the bike trails and asked people to shovel the bridges off where the, the plows can't go through. And actually I've even expanded that to um, shoveling bridges in town so 
like me with my wheelchair and and cutouts in the roads can get through. So I think accessibility, if, if you're willing to reach out to the community and other programs, as well as the park, you just keep building on each other. Yeah. You know, it, you share mm -hmm. ideas and, and it works. Well, you all, and I say you all together because obviously it is a, a real successful collaboration. But in order to make that collaboration be successful, and we hear this from a lot of parks, we put, we put a lot of effort in developing things like tape programs, the track chair, beach access, and nobody uses it. How are you informing the public on a regular basis so that they know that these things exist, they know how to request it, uh, they know you're, you're able to get the word out so that you are getting that constant uh, usage of it. How are you doing that? How is that effective? Well, I, I'll start out with just saying that, um, again, it's that collaboration between both organizations. Uh, the National, the Sleeping Bear Dunes has a wonderful website that talks about accessibility and the Friends has a great website that talks about accessibility and there's links. So if you, if you don't maybe find what you want on one, you go to the, the link to like, like the friends site and, and laid out on these websites are all the, you know, all the different options that are currently available for accessibility. Um, so that is one way we get the word out. I think the other way is just by, um, you know, uh, just being out there, especially in this, uh, we didn't do much of it this year or last year, but the first year, you know, we were, out there and um, uh, they, call, they have a thing called Saturday, or Saturday night, Friday night live in Traverse City where we took the track chair to get people to know about the track chair. Track chair was in the, um, and that and then it, it was in the uh, Glen Arbor parade. So we do those kinds of things, but we also, it's not just about the track chair. We also have, you know, uh, gone to like um, the veterans administration, maybe some assisted living and things like that and given out some information about these are the, you know, these are some of the options that somebody with some challenges, um, you know, would be able to uh, activities they would be able to do. Um, Scott or Jean, do you want to add to how we get that community involvement or community yeah, involvement? physical therapists um, offices and people who uh, do prosthetics. Um, we've tried to leave um, brochures on accessibility at those locations as well as you know in in most areas that tourists come to there's um, a collection of information inc including the visitor center in Traverse City where you can pick up cards and um, we have those out rack cards out where where that information is um, we had a again thanks to NEEP we had a, an open house um, where we could feature that but the rehab centers um, if you have a Re rehabilitation center in the area they're they're good and then a lot of it gets to be word of mouth you know my 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 neighbor told me that they were able to do this my cousin saw this you know here or there um mm -hmm. but um and honestly because the track chair develops so much interest we try to also say there's other accessible things in the park when we're communicating with with the people coming out you know you might want to check out Glen Haven you might want to check out the um the heritage trail which is the multi-use trail if they're fishing you know you might want to look at what's accessible for that so that so that they're not just doing one thing either so they're realizing there's other options for them yeah, and are things like the track chair, is there videos or photos of that available also on the track chair? I mean, I'm sorry, on the, on the uh, website, rather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Scott, yeah, but look, I was, I was just going to say, Ray, look at a couple of the earlier comments. Uh, I'm going to have to say we have a couple broken links because a few folks in the comment section were having a hard time getting between the parks website and friends. So. Now I have homework for tomorrow. We'll figure out what broken links are out there. But in, in, I guess the, the third piece of it, right now there's 170 employees of Sleeping Bear. And 
hopefully every one of them know these programs. We try to uh, incorporate it into all of our training. And so when they see visitors in the park that may uh, benefit from some of these things, it gives them the opportunity to matter whether they're a biologist or uh, a custodian to uh, help visitors find the other opportunities they may have access to. And does Sleeping Bear uh, connect up with any other parks, whether it's state or local parks, that uh, people can kind of connect up with the park, utilize any of these features that build upon as a park system? Does that occur within the area of Sleeping Bear? Uh, I would say it occurs more with the local land conservancy groups within the within our immediate area that also have trails, snowshoeing, cross country, hiking, biking. Uh, a lot of our cross is with those groups. Uh, Michigan State Parks has an amazing track chair program. I believe I was reading an article a couple of days ago. They have track chairs in six or seven, seven yeah. right now. And they're on a fundraising kick to double that this year. Um, if you didn't see in the comments, a track chair, and correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, the introductory model is $15,000. And so it's not a cheap investment, um, but the uh, the results of that investment are priceless. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, Scott, I do have one thing as we're getting fairly close to... Uh, uh, the end of our uh, presentation part, we want to be able to uh, reach out to those individuals that might be able to uh, have an opportunity to ask some questions of you. Uh, I do want to ask if you had the opportunity right now, and I'm assuming that there are many superintendents on the line right now, what message would you like to share with them as far as what you've done at Sleeping Bear and what you think they should do to take similar steps? Uh, you know, I think the first piece, and I was a benefit of when I arrived here five years ago, is have that introductory conversation with the local community. Gene just named off several groups that you could have that conversation with. It started here with Northern Michigan, um, the Disability Network, but it was physical therapy areas. It was rehab centers. It was having a conversation with the users of what the park could do better to welcome you here. And then I think the second piece of advice uh, you hit on at the very beginning, Ray, is universal accessibility. It's not, it's not trying to meet ADA. It is going beyond that so that it is a seamless visit and it's not two routes for a family to get to the front door or to the river. It is one route that is easy access for everyone. And so um, take that extra step to, it, to look for universal accessibility uh, and to uh, provide that opportunity across the board without it being a highlight. Okay, thank you, Scott. And we have one minute before we go to uh, questions. So uh, Lori or Jean, if one of you also want to make a closing comment on behalf of the uh, Friends Accessibility Group. Um, Jean, do you want to? <laughs> I, you know, I was going to say that it's, I've just been involved for the, a little over three years and it. It's just, I think it's all about building relationships. Um, not only relationships with the community, but relationship with like the park and the friends and other organizations. It's just so seamless. It just seems so natural. And I, I don't know really, to be honest with you, if there's any kind of recipe of how we got there or any steps, it just kind of evolved. And I know that I feel very comfortable and others in the, um, and the friends feel comfortable contacting the park and the park feels com comfortable contacting us. And it's, I think it's those kind of relationships has really helped um, make the process easier and make, and if there's concerns, you know, being able to solve those concerns. And I think it's patience. Um, yeah. I, I know I've told Scott and Lori this and Ray that I came in, you know, we're assessing these trails. This is what needs to be done. Let's do it. And then realizing that that's really not the way it works and just being willing to listen and learn, um, from both ends. I mean, it, it's, it was 
it was friends learning also um, and and not giving not giving up just be patient listen um, try to work around the problems on both ends and and I think we've been very fortunate that um, the park listened and um, we were able to mediate some areas and say, okay, we, we can't do like, for example, the mobile map, but we can do this and we can wait until this plant is done blooming before we put the walkway in. <laughs> so, um, Thank you, you Jean. Know, so. And it's obvious that it is a very collaborative relationship between the accessibility committee of the friends group and the National Park Service. I'd like to now turn it back to our host so that we can start uh, taking some questions from our participants this, uh, today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, now that the time is a little over 745, we're going to go into our Q&A. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Ray or any of our other panelists, go ahead and send them in the Q&A function or in the chat, and I'm going to field them to our panelists. Um, but to get started, I did uh, source one from the chat that I'd like to start off with um, to Ray or anyone who else would like, who would like to answer. Um, does every track chair need a volunteer and how do new volunteers get involved with the program? Um, Lori or Jean, I think that's a question for you. Yeah. Ellen, could you repeat that please? I'm sorry. I, I... Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone asked, does every track chair need a volunteer? So every time a track chair goes out, do they need to be accompanied by a volunteer? Okay, yeah. In our, in our program, yes. Some of the state parks do it differently. But for our program, a volunteer has, yes, it goes out with them, meets them, gets the chair ready, gives them a little orientation, and then goes out with them. Um, but like I said, there, there's room for this, you know, some, some of the state parks do it a little different. Um, but that's the way we do it here at the at, and it's and it's a very like we said over and over a very rewarding experience. And, and then what was the second part of the question, Ellen? Um, how do you new new volunteers get involved with the program? I, I think again, it's just that recruiting, putting out the things um, on our different websites, different social media, and getting volunteers involved. Or uh, one of our former volunteers will say, "Hey, this is a great program." you know and they get their friends to come um mm -hmm. those are some of the ways and then we um and and, and many of our volunteers as gene mentioned earlier th luckily came back we had a really good show of volunteers just i think just because of the nature of the program yeah if i could jump in we had a really good conversation with friends over the volunteer accompanying the chair as we are coming up with the operations for this and uh, a couple pieces of the reason why we settled on a volunteer company. Um, first, the volunteer may be right with the family if the family wants them, or the volunteer might be 50 yards away, uh, just there, just in case. And one of the reasons that we talked at the very beginning of having a volunteer company was to deflect other visitors from asking questions of the family on their experience. So that if a visitor was enamored with this idea or wanted to know more, the family could continue their family experience and the volunteer could handle the operational questions. And I think we, and the volunteer gives sort of the family opportunity. Would you like me to walk with you or do you want privacy? And I'm going to be 50 yards behind you. And if you have any problems, let me know. And so we put a lot of thought to that. Sure, yeah, and something else that um, I want to add on to that question is the training that goes into becoming a volunteer. How long um, does that process take? <laughs> Jean? <laughs> oh. Well, it's, um, there's a uh, sort of the um, form part of it where, you know, we, we explain the waivers that need to be signed and the process of how you'll be contacted as a volunteer I would say that's probably about an hour meeting. And then um, there's uh, getting the chair out of the trailer, which, um, what would you say, Lori? That process that's is about, about an hour, half about hour? Half hour to, to have them you know, learn how to get the chair in and out, and then learn how to work the chair as far as um, not the operation of, of moving it, but like adjustments. 
you know, how do you adjust the footrest? How do you adjust the headrest? How do you adjust the harness? Uh, you've got, we have bolsters. So that goes into the um, part of the training. And then the big part of the training is we have our volunteers go out in the chair before they ever take anybody out. So they can feel, because it, it can be a little bumpy and a little intimidating at times, what it feels like in that chair. Um, so all our volunteers um, will take a group out and they just switch back and forth and, and go on the trace chair. So I would say at least a good, for the whole process, would you say, Gene, about two, three hours? Um, the, the hike itself takes about an hour. Yeah. And yeah, I would say th three hours. Mm -hmm about um give or take i think we i think we ask people to allow like three hours to to come up and do the trail just because we'd rather send them home ahead of time than than run over so most volunteers like the, the hike because it's oh, yeah. you know it's fun to try it we found that experience to be really important um so that if uh, um, there's, there's a pretty steep hill to come down. And if you've tried it in the track chair, um, you're able to um, kind of coach the person in the chair through it if they have some hesitation. Um, I don't think most people do, but every once in a while, there'll be someone who looks at that hill and goes, yeah, I'm not doing that. But, but they do, they, they do it because we have good volunteers who can explain it to how to go down. Sure. Thank you all so much for, for collaboratively answering that question. That was super helpful. Um, here's another question that I feel from the chat earlier in the conversation. Um, someone asked, how widespread are these types of accessibility projects across the National Park Service? And are there any plans to expand these types of projects to other parks? <laughs> Um, well, Ray, feel free oh, to Scott, here as well. Uh, I think just in terms of looking at the way the National Park Service operates is that uh, each park is autonomous. And typically when these types of programs are developed, it, it's a little bit of a grassroots effort. Uh, quite frequently, people will see what type of success Sleeping Bear Dunes has had with this program and I can pretty much bet by this time next year, there will be several other parks that by contacting uh, Scott, Gene, and Laurie will probably be developing not necessarily the same program, but similar programs, whether it's how to develop a friends group or what to do with the track chair or whatever. But the National Park Service does work a lot by exa good examples of successful programs, and then other parks will emulate them based on that. Yeah, what Ray said. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Ray. And, and Scott, you didn't even have to add to that. <laughs> Ray answered the question <laughs> for you. Um, all right, looks like we might have time for one or two more questions. Um, here's one from Diana. Can a person get training online or remotely and then come to the park as a volunteer or are there no remote opportunities for volunteers as of yet? Interesting. Um, well, we don't, we just started this year again, kind of an, uh, from, from COVID and the worry of, um, you know, at the time, we don't want people too close maybe to uh, our volunteers and stuff. So we, we did do two videos this year. This is the first time we've done it. We have a training video that someone, a volunteer could watch that goes a little dry, but goes through all the uh, things that the chair does, all the adjustments, how to get it in and out of the trailer, all of that. That's all now on a video that we just produced this. And it's, I th I'm, I'm hoping it's been helpful for our volunteers because when they're out there and you're giving them all that information, they might, I, even myself, I forget, oh gosh, how does this foot rest adjust? Well, then you can go to the video and take a look at that. So we did that. And then we also have just a short little video for the visitors, excuse me, the visitors to see how the chair operates. So that's a picture of the joystick, how it moves, how the tilt moves, how the chair moves around. 
Um, so we've done that remotely. So, so starting in that direction. I, I, I think yeah, I would say that you the, the thing you can't do remotely yeah. is actually, you would have to have that time to come out and take it out of the trailer and take it on the chair or take it on the trail. Um, that would be, you could, you could do the other things. And we've done that with some volunteers who they did watch the, the Zoom that we had about the forms. And then when they got here, they went out or they're going out, Lori, I think. Is that part of what you're doing tomorrow? Right, right. Um, with them, so. So yeah, I think the question, the answer is yes, you can do some things remotely, but then there's still things you really need in person for. That makes a lot of sense. Great, thank you so much. Well, we are winding down on our time here. Looks like we got about three minutes left. So I wanna take some time for each of you, if you have any final thoughts or organizations, um, resources for our attendees to tap into following this round table. If any of you have anything to share, now is the time to do so. And I would love to hear from you all. Go ahead, Scott, why don't you begin? You know, um, there's, there are a lot of resources out there and I see a few of them pointing up on the right side. You know, I think uh, success is started with someone asking the question. And that's, you know, a lot of the things that we've talked about today started because Gene or another member of Friends asked the park, hey, can we do this? And it's, it started with the park asking Friends to do some trail assessments. And it's been a ping pong call back and forth ever since. Uh, with everybody with the same goal, which is uh, universal accessibility, that you can come to the National Lakeshore and experience it on your own terms. And so, uh, you know, if any of the groups on here that have questions or comments or uh, want to talk, feel free to give me a ring. And I, I assume my, my contact information is somewhere in this uh, format. I guess I would say- Lori? Yeah, I, I would say collaboration, developing those relationships, um, not giving up when there's those challenges, because there's going to be challenges and there's going to be challenges you don't even know are going to be there until you start something like a track chair program. And just, you know, keep plugging away. I think those are all really important things, um, the success of, uh, of having a good, um, a good accessibility options and programs. Thanks, Lori and Jean. Um, if you are just going to say, if you want to contact um, Lori and I for information about the track chair, the email is trackchair at friendsofsleepingbear.org. Um, and that email will come to uh, one of us or our other administrative volunteers. Um, as far as track chair programs, I'd suggest if you're interested, besides contacting us, um, there's a program in Wisconsin called Access, it's two words, Access Ability Wisconsin that runs their program more on an independent basis. Um, if that's something your park's interested in, it, it wouldn't have worked at all for us. But they were helpful with information. And Staunton, S-T-A-U-T-O-N, State Park in Colorado, um, has a track chair program that uses volunteers as we do, and they might be able to provide you with some information. Um, they, they were helpful to us. And then reach out to your local um, disability network, um, rehab centers, ask them what, what tools they might know of. They're, they're, there's always new things coming out. They might know of something that would be helpful. Thank you, Jean. And since we are at the uh, top of the hour right now, I will just say on behalf of people with disabilities who utilize parks, whether they be national, state or local parks or any other land uh, management area, I just wanna say thank you all for all that you shared tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you.
Yes, thank all of, all of you guys so much for your time and effort in putting this, this entire webinar together and for sharing your experiences. Um, I know for me, it's been really informative and I'm sure everyone watching feels the same. So super grateful to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, and like Ray said, we're at the top of the hour. So if, if anyone else has any last thoughts, here, now's the time. Otherwise we'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.